In the previous video, we started discussing quantum circuits with more than just one qubit, but restricted our attention to circuits that generate what are known as separable states. Now it turns out that separable states are only a very small fraction of all the possible states we can represent using quantum circuits. A much larger fraction of states are what are known as entangled states. So to understand the difference between a separable and an entangled state, we need to introduce the concept of quantum entanglement. So let's do this by again using the spin of a particle as an example of the physical implementation of a qubit. So let's start by first considering the case of two completely independent particles. So let's draw, for example, two electrons with their spins in the plus z direction. And let's go ahead and draw a wall in between them to represent that they're completely isolated from each other. So if we wanted to measure the spin of this electron, well, we know that we could, for example, here on the left, put our stern gerlach device with this magnetic field pointing in the plus z direction. And we know that if we send this particle through this apparatus, well, we will see it deflecting in the plus z direction with 100% probability. And very similarly, if we were to do that with a particle on the right, we would expect to see the exact same result. So if we want to express these particles using our qubit representation, well, we say the particle on the left is in state zero and same for the one on the right. So the total system state will be zero tensor zero. Similarly, if we had the spin of these particles pointing, let's say the plus X and minus X direction, well, we know the one on the right will be state plus, the one on the left will be state minus. And if we're still measuring these particles using a magnetic field in the plus Z direction, well, we know that both of them will deflect either upwards or downwards with 50% probability. And we also know that the total state of the system then will be state minus tensor plus, which we can always represent in terms of uh, state zero and state one as an equal superposition of zero minus one tensored, an equal superposition of zero plus one. And then we can distribute this to get the state zero zero plus zero one minus one zero minus one one. And we know that this state is separable because, well, first, physically, these two electrons are isolated from each other. But as we discussed in the previous video, we can also tell that they're separable by looking at the ket representation of the state and realizing that this is factorizable into state minus and state plus. Now let's consider a slightly different scenario where we start with a particle with spin equal to zero. And we know from some experimentation that this particle actually decays into two particles that we know have spin. Now, because of the law of conservation of angular momentum, we know that the spin of these two particles has to be complementary because if we start with spin equal to zero, then the total angular momentum or the total spin of the sum of the two separate particles must also be equal to zero. So we want to know what the spin of these particles is. So what do we do? Well, again, we take a, let's say a stringer like apparatus here on the right with this magnetic field pointing in the plus Z direction to measure what the spin of this particle is. And we do the exact same thing for the particle on the left. And then we repeat this experiment many, many times. And what we notice is that in 50% of the experiments we perform to the particle on the right side, we see the particle deflecting upwards. And then the other 50% of the time we see it deflecting downwards. For the particle on the left, we observe the exact same result, 50% of the time the particle deflects downwards, and 50% of the time it deflects upwards. And because of the law of conservation of angular momentum, the result of these two particles is always anti-correlated, meaning that whenever we measure the particle on the right deflecting upwards, the particle on the left deflects downwards, and whenever we see the particle on the right deflecting downwards, the one on the left deflects upwards. So we could conclude that every time this spin zero particle decays, the particle on the right ends up either with spin in the plus Z direction, 
and then the particle on the left would spin in the minus z direction. And in our qubit notation, that will be state one zero. And then we see that, you know, the other half of the time, this particle might be decaying with a particle on the right having its spin pointing down and the particle on the left, its spin pointing up. So that's state zero one. So we conclude that if we repeat this over and over again, we have with probability of one half each of these two possible states. However, here we can ask ourselves, is this particle really decaying into two separate particles with their spins always aligned with the z direction? There really shouldn't be any preferential direction in which these two particles decay. Just because we're measuring in the plus z direction doesn't mean the particles were generated in that same direction. Well, one thing we could do to check this is to, instead of measuring the spin of the electron along the z axis, well, we could change the Stern Gerlach devices to measure spin along the x axis. And what's remarkable about this is that when we do this, we still observe that the particle on the right deflects in the plus x direction 50% of the time. But for those 50% of the times, the particle on the left always deflects in the minus x direction. And then similarly, when the particle on the right deflects in the minus x direction, the one on the left deflects always in the plus x direction. So that would mean that if we perform measurements with the magnetic field of our Stenger like device aligned in the plus x direction, we measure state minus plus and state plus minus, each with 50% probability. Furthermore, if we were to repeat this experiment with the magnetic field of the Stenger like device aligned in any other direction, we would always see this perfect correlation between the two particles. What this means is that the particle is really not decaying half of the time with the spin in the plus z and minus z direction. Instead, these particles are in what is known as an entangled state, which is represented by a superposition of the possible directions in which the two particles can deflect. So for example, in the case of measuring along the z direction, we have a superposition state of one over root two state one zero plus state zero one. Similarly, when we're measuring along the x axis, we'll have one over root two state minus plus minus state plus minus. Now you may say, well, wouldn't this mean that the state the two particles are in depends on our orientation of our measurement apparatus? And the answer is no, we can actually show that these two states are perfectly equivalent. So let's take, for example, the state here for when we measure along the x axis. And if we replace here, the state minus for its representation in terms of zero and one, and then tensored with what we have for state plus, and then minus what we have for the state plus minus, which would be the same as we have up here, but with the signs reversed. If we do the math for this, we'll find out that this is equivalent to the state one over root two, one zero plus zero one. So mathematically, these two states here are equivalent to each other. Furthermore, if we were to align the Stenger like apparatus in any other direction, we can also show that the state that represents the two particles is equivalent to one over root two state one zero plus state zero one. And this is what we called an entangled state. So basically looking back at that same example, if we have state one zero plus state zero one, the state is entangled because first of all, there's no way we can factorize this into two separate states for the two separate qubits. And second of all, the outcomes of measuring this state are highly correlated. So we know that if we perform a measurement with 50% probability, we'll measure state one zero, which means that if we were to only measure the qubit on the left, even if we haven't measured the qubit on the right, we know with certainty it will be in state zero. Similarly, the other 50% of the time, we'll measure state zero one. So again, if we measured just one of the two qubits, let's say in this case, the qubit to the right and get state one, we will know for a fact that the qubit on the left will be in state zero. So now let's take a look and see how can we generate entangled states using quantum circuits. So if we start with a qubit in state zero and apply a Hallmark gate to it, 
we know that we place it in an equal superposition of state one over root two, zero plus one. Now if we take a second qubit and then apply it a control X gate with the control at the top qubit and the target at the bottom qubit, well, here at the beginning, we know that we start in state zero tensor zero. After the Hadamard gate, we know that we have the top one in superposition, but the bottom one is still in state zero. And then we can analyze what happens after the CX gate. Well, we know that the CX gate flips the state of the target qubit only if its control is in state one. So here after the CX gate, we're going to get one over root two, state zero tensor zero, because the control queue is at zero, so our target queue would remain at zero, plus state one tensored, and now the bottom qubit is going to flip to state one. So here we've generated an entangled state because as you can see, this is not factorizable. And again, like we said before, if we were to measure just one of these two qubits, let's say the qubit to the left, and we find it to be in state zero, we will know for a fact that the qubit on the right will also be in state zero. Now, this doesn't look like the example we have here above, but we can get to that state very easily. If we just apply an X gate to the stop qubit, here we can see that we have now the state one over root two, and then we flip the state of that first qubit. So now we have here one tensored, the bottom qubit we leave alone, so that's zero. Plus, now this state one gets flipped, so that's state zero, tensored state one. And as you can see, now we've generated the same state we had, for example. So now let's go ahead and see how we can implement this circuit using Qiskit. So as we've been doing before, we're going to import the quantum circuit class and the state vector class. So let's create a quantum circuit. But now we're going to have two qubits. We're going to apply a Hallmark gate to that top qubit, which we denote as qubit one and then a CX gate between the top qubit and the bottom qubit. Let's go ahead and draw that circuit. So here's the circuit we analyzed before. Let's also go ahead and add that X gate like we did at the end of the analysis on qubit one. Now we can look at the state vector by using the state vector class, passing that quantum circuit. And here we have that equal superposition of state zero one and state one zero. Now, if we wanted to perform a simulation with measurements, there's two ways we can do this. We can save this, let's say in variable Q, and we can use that method sample counts from the state vector object. And we can say, okay, sample it a hundred times. Let's save that into counts. Uh, let's call it SV for state vector. And let's print that. So we get about 50% of the time state zero one, and about the other 50% of the time state one zero as expected. But we could also take this circuit and add a measurement block and perform a simulation with a simulator, right? So we already have this quantum circuit object. So one, we, one thing we can do is we don't need to redefine it. We can use this measure all function, which even if we haven't specified that this quantum circuit should have classical registers, it would automatically add those registers for us. So let's go ahead and now draw the circuit again. And see here we can see we had the same circuit we had before, but it, it's now added measurement blocks and a measurement register. So to simulate this, we're going to import from Qiskit providers and then basic provider. We import the basic simulator we used before, and then we're going to define our simulator object. And then to run the simulation, we do let's do count simulator, we do sim.run, we pass the circuit, the number of shots, and then we know that this is going to execute the simulation to extract the results, we do dot result, and then to get the counts from the experiment, we do get counts, and then we can print this count sim, which should give us something similar to what we got from the state vector object. So 61 times we got state zero one and 39 times state one zero, it should be closer to 50 50. So we can run it again. And here we see that we get about 50 50 for each of these two states. And again, like we did before from Qiskit visualization, we can import the plot histogram function to plot our counts in a nicer way. So here we have it with uh, fully simulated a circuit that generates an entangled state and perform measurements to see that we get 
50% of the time state 0, 1, and 50% of the time state 1, 0. So here we can see that the measurements are correlated. Every time we measure a 0 in one of the two qubits, we always measure a 1 in the other one, and vice versa, which is very different from what we would get if we put place both qubits in equal superposition. So let's, let's, for example, do that. So instead of entangling the qubits, let's just create a circuit with a Hallamar gate applied to both qubits. And let's add this measure all function. So we perform measurements and then we can run that simulation. And here we can see that we get a quarter of the time each of the all four possible states. So let's plot that. Here we see we get about 25 counts per each of the four possible combinations, which means that the two qubits are completely uncorrelated, right? If we measure a zero on the first qubit, there's nothing we can say about the second qubit. It could be either zero or one. Similarly, if we measure a one, the second qubit could also be zero and one with equal probability. So unlike an entangled state, where there's a correlation between the outcomes of the two states in a separable state like this one, the measurements of one qubit are completely uncorrelated from the measurements of the other qubit. So that's it for this video. So in the next few videos, we're going to formalize the definition of a qubit and explain why is it that we need complex numbers for our full definition. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.